Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, council meeting. It's nice to see so many people out in the gallery. Uh, for those of you on a Kajiko, please don't adjust your set. I'm Councillor Frank Danch, and I'm the uh, mayor at this time while uh, Mayor Vance is out trying to uh, sell our city. So if I could at this time, I'd ask for uh, Councillor Butters to say a prayer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, as well as uh, the prayer, I've chosen to read a short paragraph to honor and remember Nelson Mandela, who we lost this week. It's written by Marion Williamson from her book, um, A Return to Love. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And if you'll all join me in there, my Christmas prayer tonight, Father of us all, like Mary, we carry God's promise within us. Like Joseph, we journey in faith at his bidding. Like the Magi, we follow the signs that compel us to seek him. Like the shepherds, we give glory to God for his presence among us. As Christmas approaches, and as we hope, anticipate, and prepare for his arrival, may our journey always be one of hope and faith. May we find God in all those we meet along the way. May we give thanks for his presence in our lives, and may we forever keep his promise in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to have the uh, McKay Choir come in and sing Old Canada and a couple Christmas carols for us.
From the case school, we wish you a Merry Christmas. We, uh, it's fun to be here. This is a really unique opportunity, and it's exciting for me. I'm a, a new resident of the area, and, uh, and, and first year teacher at McKay. And for each of these boys and girls that are here from McKay School, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we're going to sing a few Christmas carols here. Deck the Halls is our first one. And so, can I have my, uh, can I have my football screw on this side? And you guys can have these slide over a bit? So we can join right now. We have Isaac joining us on guitar here as well. So Isaac, if you get the uh, you know, one side, you'll be the right speaker, I'll be left. Right. <laughs> Playing in stereo today. Ready? <laughs>
little token of appreciation from the city. Okay, guys, we're going to continue our meeting as uh, we'd like to have the, uh, if there, ask Ashley if there's any addendum items tonight. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, none this evening. Thank you, Ashley. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Howe would like to speak? Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, I've been asked by His Worship, this is his favorite, most favorite council meeting to attend in the year. He uh, is representing the city. He is currently at a meeting on Wall Street in New York in respect of some potential business meeting with people from Wall Street, parts of the United States, and Europe. Um, hopefully it's going to come to fruition, but it's very important. He is very unhappy that he is not here, especially um, with the kids, but more particularly with his former babysitter that he himself wanted to specifically congratulate on his retirement bill. <laughs> so he wanted me to pass that on he really, he will be speaking to you next week, um, but he sends his regrets, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Heil. So we'd like to get someone to uh, confirm the agenda, please. Councillor Bodner, Councillor Doucette. Are there any disclosures of interest tonight? All in favor? Sorry, there we go. Learning as we go. Any disclosures of interest? With none, uh, we'll go to the uh, determination of committee items requiring separate discussion. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Uh, items number seven and number eight, please. Anyone else? Councillor Damaris. Thank you, Acting, Acting Mayor. Item 20, please.
Councillor Kenny. Deputy Mayor, I'd like to speak on item two. Also, like to speak on seven and eight and item fourteen. So uh, we'd like to get the uh, committee items not requiring separate discussion for approval on that, please. Councillor Kenny, Councillor Steele. And let's uh, move on to presentations. Sorry, we'll call for that vote. All in favor, thank you. We'll go to the uh, presentation side. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's my pleasure tonight to uh, recognize one of our uh, professional firefighters, Mr. Bill Teal. Bill will be retiring on December 31st after 27 and a half years of full-time service with the City of Port Coburn. Bill, would you like to come up to the podium, please? You're not any taller, are you? On March the 8th, 1977, nine years before he became a full-time employee, Bill started as a volunteer firefighter. Within the volunteer ranks, he became a lieutenant in 1991, a captain in 1997, and retired from the volunteers with 30 years of service in 2000 and, uh, there's a typo there, I guess. 2007. 2007, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I know myself, I was a volunteer for 15 years in the 80s and 90s, and, uh, Bill was one of my instructors, and uh, I certainly respected Bill for uh, everything he taught me. Uh, we're also lucky enough to uh, play a little hockey together over the years, and uh, if I want to go back about 29 years, Bill even sold some of the stag tickets in the hall for my uh, stag at that time. So once again, a little personal thank you there. Um, on August 18, 1986, Bill started as a full-time firefighter. He became a full-time captain July the 8th, 2002, and our public liaison officer on August 30th, 2010. We'd like to thank you and your family for many years of dedicated service to the residents of the city of Port Coburn. Uh, Bill, on behalf of council, we'd like to present you with a plaque to commemorate your retirement. You should open that so we can have a nice picture together. <laughs> it's not Christmas yet. Nice picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bridge is down and everything, eh? Okay. Me? The bridge is down and everything. Perfect. Perfect. Don't move too quick, Bill. I'd like to call up uh, Fire Chief Tom Cartwright at this time to make his presentation. Just plain Frank, is that what you said? Okay. <laughs> Deputy Mayor, members of council, senior staff, and people in the audience, it's a pleasure this evening for me to be here and uh, just say a few words on behalf of the fire department for Bill and his efforts. And I'd also like to thank Sandy at this time for uh, her continued support of Bill. He went through a few uh, trying months, shall I say, uh, but I will say that uh, over the last four years, we've become somewhat closer in the sense that I worked up front with him pretty much every day and in his new role as a public liaison officer. Bill has made uh, great strides for our department within the community with regards to contacts, key contacts in the city with regards to the senior citizens, uh, the school programs, and uh, various other groups that work within the community, and Bill has certainly brought them into uh, our fold in the sense that we, we uh, have gotten uh, significant support from them over the last four years. Uh, he's assisted Mike in his fire prevention efforts. Uh, when Mike wasn't available, Bill would fill in on an as-needed basis. And we certainly do support uh, your efforts, Bill, and I do wish you all the best in your retirement. Uh, you've been a good guy. Uh, 
easy to talk with, and uh, I certainly support your work ethics and uh, the support you've given to this community. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Got to find your way into this, Bill. Yeah, Where you want us? Go, go ahead. I, I Come on up. Do. That's fine. Do you want us up front? Up yeah. front. Out there. Okay. Go ahead. So we'll get Bill up here just to say a few kind words to everyone in the house. You did say kind. Kind, of course. I want to thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, for recognizing me tonight, members of council as well. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, members of the Professional Firefighters Association here tonight showing their support. I really do appreciate it. And members of my family as well. Uh, and the volunteer firefighters as well here showing their support. Um, it's been a, a wonderful career, uh, something that I love to do, and uh, I can't say that I'm sorry that I'm leaving because I'm looking forward to the next chapter in my life. So um, with that, I had a two-page speech, but uh, some of us want to get back and have a little party. So with that, <laughs> with that I'm, I'm going to end that. And uh, again, thank everybody for coming out tonight. Special thanks to my wife, Sandy. Uh, she's my rock. Thank you. see why the mayor loves this part of the job. So, so now we're going to move along to our Christmas card presentation. Um, and, and I'm really uh, happy I can do this for the mayor. This year, Mayor Badaway invited the children of Port Coburn to send their pictures of Christmas in Port Coburn for our annual Christmas card event. He received submissions from children across the city, making the choice very difficult once again. I would like to share with you selections each of the five winners will receive a framed copy of their card, some blank cards to send to their family and friends, as well as these cards, postcards that have been decorated, uh, decor which decorated our Christmas float. I'd like to invite Desiree McEachran up to the podium, please. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for coming out. Desiree is a grade 8 student at St. Therese Catholic Elementary School. Her picture of the lighthouse in the harbor was selected for the front of our cards. Congratulations, Desiree. Thank you. 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 you. Thank you. you. Okay, well, why don't we do it now, and then uh, we'll get you all up here at front later on.
Okay, so next I would like to invite Emma Boys up to the podium, please. Hi, Emma. Emma's a grade six student at Oakwood Public School. Her picture of a child building a snowman at HH Snow Park was selected for the insight of our card. Congratulations, Emma. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Kathleen Mullins up to the podium, please. There you are. Catherine's a grade eight student at St. Patrick's Catholic Elementary School. Her picture of the Roseland Center for the Arts, decorated at Christmas, was selected as the inside of our card. Congratulations, Catherine. And Mr. Ohio will bring that over here. Oh, you got it already? Oh, super. Now we'll get uh, Isabella Favreau up to the podium, please. How are you? Good. Good. Isabella is a grade eight student at St. Patrick's Catholic Elementary School. Her picture of a ship passing under Bridge 21 of the Welland Canal, all decked out for Christmas, was selected for the inside of our card. Congratulations, Isabella. Last recipient tonight is Megan Sardella. Megan, would you come up to the podium? Megan's a grade eight, uh, I'm sorry, grade five student of St. John Bosco Catholic Elementary School. Her picture of City Hall decorated for Christmas was selected for the inside of our card. Congratulations, Megan. Thank you so much, you guys. You all did a wonderful job. On behalf of the mayor and uh, members of council, I'd like to thank all the students that, who submitted their pictures, and I'd be encouraged for you to start thinking about next year's uh, cards. I would also like all winners to come back here so we can get up a group photo. Please bring your frame cards with you. So come on up front, you guys, and we'll take one more shot with all of you together, okay? Yeah. <laughs> 
call that del delegations now? Yeah. Okay. So I, I believe we've got uh, Nancy Meiner, uh, Meisner out there tonight. She's with the uh, Friends of L Roselawn, and she's going to give us an overview of their progress and current status and the future plans working with the city. Alrighty, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Originally a group of community members who were interested in the existing offerings of art and culture at the Roselawn Centre. We um, got together, we had a lot of town, town hall kind of meetings, we brainstormed. Then the opportunity came along for us to do Doors Open in October. I see a lot of familiar faces of people who were there and, and participated and, and came and supported us. Um, Originally, it was uh, Councillor Ron Bodner and our volunteer, William Thomas, one of our main city volunteers, um, who got everybody together. The group recognizes the heritage significance of the Roselawn Mansion, its need for renovation, renewal, and preservation. Friends of Roselawn... I can't get, how do you get this to advance? I don't know. <laughs> You're asking me. <laughs> Just give us one second. Technical glitch. <laughs> Use the roller. Okay. You got it? Yep. Okay. Um, the Friends of Roselawn also recognizes the fact that interest in art and culture is growing in Port Colborne and in the Niagara region, I, I understand, from Barb, the newly formed group that the region has now too and the need for art and cultural development to be accessible for all members I'm of the community. Problem. It's not going. Yeah, can you? Okay, found it, okay. Want to chair? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, where are you? <laughs> I'm right here, and we needed to search for some successful models. Okay, I'm good. okay. All right, are we online? Yep, yep, are we I good? Can see it now. Okay, yep. thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, this past August, there was a tax force that was formed, and we traveled o over to Burlington to their art center. It's a magnificent facility. If you haven't been there, I recommend that you go. Let's just let Pat catch up with us. There you go, yeah. Alrighty. It's a community-based facility. It's, it's seen as a community center. It does have some um, funding from grants from private and also from the city council because, or the, within the city budget because it's seen as a community center. So it has activities pretty much seven days a week year round that are offered. Um, and because it's a community center, it has free admission. So we were looking at, at their model. So Denis Longchamp, he was uh, a very gracious guide. He took us through the facilities. There's Denis there. They have a gallery, a very large gallery. And they have workshops or studios, conference areas, meeting rooms, banquet facilities. Um, the gift shop itself has displays of works from talented artists from the Burlington and Hamilton area, but also from across Ontario. And they also have a rental set up where you can rent pieces of art and, have, and bring them home for a period of time and framing available. So it's quite, quite extensive. Um, after we had a, a, a tour of the Burlington Arts Centre with Denis Longchamp, then he sat down and he talked with us about the financial structures and how they do their fundraising, how they have memberships, their, their uh, gold members down to their uh, lower numbers, you know, for, for donations. So we got really excited about that because we were there going, oh, Port Colburn should have something like this. 
We already have the beginnings of it. We have the Port Colborne Rose Lawn Centre for the Arts. So then we thought, well, we have to find another model because the Centre for the Arts here has a mansion attached to it, which adds another component to it. So after discussions with the Manager of Community Services for the City of Port Colborne, we have also looked at the Willistead Manor in Walkerville. City of Windsor and feel that it's a good example of what a home for Port Colborne's Rose Lawn Centre for the Arts could become. The Willistead Manor is supported by a group called the Friends of Willistead and is preserved historic mansion which offers art, culture and community activities. Isn't that beautiful? Can't you see the double parlour at Rose Lawn for Christmas all decorated? It'd be lovely. Now there is a video on their website right now that speaks to that because they're bringing in the design students from the community colleges and they're also uh, bringing in local florists to do their decorating and I think we've got some pretty strong contenders in our community too with the Niagara College programs that are going on for that. Back in October we were invited by the city to host the Binational Doors Open Niagara and we had a blast. I have to say we had so much fun doing that. We really appreciated the city inviting us to do that. Um, we looked at the facility and what are we gonna do? Just open the doors and let you wander through? No way, Friends of Roseland wasn't gonna just do that. We decided we've gotta open up the doors, we've gotta show the facility in action. Because if people are coming through, we wanted them to see the potential. We wanted them to be able to look at it and say, I could rent here, I could use this facility, I'm a member of the community and I, I see some other use for this particular room. Um, Bob Heil was up there singing away with the Operatic Society, we had all kinds of fun. Good people, the town crier was there, lots of fun. We had over 400 people that came through, 342 that signed in but a large number of people snuck in the back door, so we're saying over 400. Um, as a result of, of the Doors Open success, um, there was a small core group of us that worked on that and we felt it was time to formalize the group and that's what we want to let the council know tonight. The group has had an election, we do have an executive, we have not-for-profit uh, application pending and uh, the people that worked on that, we had a task force initially but the people that signed the application have now formed our first board of directors. So we're ready. We're ready to start looking to the future for Roseland, looking for opportunities for joint ventures with City Council, for applications for grants. We've taken a look at the Cortec report and we've seen the recommendations, the estimated expenses that would be involved for the different areas that need to be addressed. They have a 20 year plan of what should be done soon, <laughs> later, and you know, down the line. Um, and so we're, we're quite excited about taking a, a real good stab at trying to get this art and cultural center on the map. I think it draws, the, you know, the, the showboat, I moved here, I have to say, I, I moved here in 2005 from St. Catharines. And, and the theater here, I had never been to prior to that, but I had family members who always bought season's tickets, always brought my mom down. It was always an outing where they went for dinner and they came down here and they enjoyed it. So I knew about Rose Lawn in name only when I moved here. And, it, and it's a shame to see the building uh, isn't utilized to its fullest you know, potential at this point. And that's one thing that Rose Lawn, Friends of Rose Lawn would like to see happen through programming and um, with Jennifer Bowman, she's been quite helpful when we have ideas of art classes and things that we think could be offered to the community. I have to say the prices have been very fair. It makes it art classes accessible to so many people. And um, along those lines, we've uh, had a meeting with Linda Reinhardt at Port Cares, and she does have some funding that she can put leisure, uh, leisure time expenses through for some of the clientele that she's serving. And a lot of people have signed up and said that they would be interested in art classes on their questionnaire. So we're seeing some more partnerships. We've had. The high school is in partnership with us, the Operatic Society, you know, Music Depot. It's been very positive and very, and I have to say, we've really been supported by the city and the city staff, um, the staff at Roselawn 
and you know anything that we've asked it's been pretty good you know, we can't complain that's for sure um, at this point we know that their task has been set for a new art and cultural master plan to be developed for Port Colborne um, and the manager of community services who's heading that up has invited two of our executive members to be on a steering committee um, we have had a few meetings we're looking at terms of reference and then we're moving forward to review the old document from 1992 or 3 I believe and then build on that and you know and, and bring it up to date and up to snuff with what is available in Port Colburn at this time so basically I think I, I think I can say to the, the council at this point, the Friends of Rose Lawn is really looking forward to having some more positive partnerships and to, to work together on projects. I know that there are some grants that can be applied for for certain things by the city on their own, but, and there are some that we could apply for, but there are some that would be excellent if we could have partnership on those applications and and we're ready for that thank you very much are you finished <laughs> where are you at pat lovely pictures thanks nancy uh anybody have any questions for at this time uh ron uh, i know you're active down there no thank you thank you so much Okay, well, I guess it's the mayor's report, and since I'm uh, just a deputy mayor, I don't have a lot to report on at this time. I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for showing up tonight, and uh, I can see why the mayor kind of likes this job. Sitting up in the middle is uh, not a bad thing. Wait. <laughs> no. <laughs> so at this time, uh, since we have no mayor's report, uh, we'll ask uh, Regional Councillor Barrick to maybe give us his words of wisdom. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. You're doing a fine job, sir. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to wish Council, the public, and those in attendance uh, this evening a Merry Christmas. Uh, first and foremost, the holiday season is upon us. And uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity this evening to discuss the Niagara Region's 2014 budget. Uh, it is early. We are done, subject to final approval uh, this Thursday. Um, but I will be brief. Our guidance for budget uh, on operating, we set out in the spring, and uh, we had set it to be at 2%. We know the cost of government governance, as this council well knows, increases every year regarding uh, our costs and inflation, et cetera. So we thought 2% was responsible, and I'm happy to say that we're coming in at a 1.89% operating uh, increase on the levy, which is about $34 per household. Our rate budget for water is going to go up 0.08%. For wastewater, it's going down 0.73%. And waste management is going up 1.13%. So in my view, overall stable, um, stable rate budget. We also have a 2014 capital uh, budget request of $219 million. Uh, which includes a slew of capital projects in 2014 and beyond. And part of that includes uh, over $10 million in capital funding for Port Colborne regarding uh, Northland Point, uh, water storage in Port Colborne, as well as roads. <coughs> Some of the highlights include over $2 million in funding to support economic development, investing $100,000 to support agricultural <coughs> action plan initiatives, including a food and farming strategy, $70 million for transportation capital program, including road resurfacing. Maintaining Niagara Emergency Medical Services response time in the 90th percentile. Implementing a new physical health development and nutrition program for all child care operators that service preschool age children. One and a half million dollars of continued funding to reduce and prevent poverty through the Niagara Prosperity Initiative. Implementing a 10 year housing and homelessness plan and proceeding with court facilities renewal project to establish new accommodations in Niagara. 
So that's the uh, a very high level overview of the 2014 budget, again, subject to final approval this Thursday. And if I may, Deputy Mayor, I'd like to also take this opportunity to encourage those who are fortunate enough this holiday season to think of others in the community this time of year. And uh, Port Cares is always accepting donations uh, within our community. And also to acknowledge Jack O'Neill and his efforts in raising money for those in need in the Philippines and those abroad. Um, he's accepting donations $2 or greater at the Friends Over 55 Center, and I believe as well all of the Meridian branches in the Niagara region will be accepting donations for that as well. So those, that's my council's report. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions at this time for Regional Councilor Barrick? Thank you so much, and all the best of the season. You're making it easy on me. So we'll go to councillors. Sorry? We're not finished. We're not finished? <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So we'll move on to councillors' issues and inquiries. Uh, who would like to go first? Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a question. To, I don't, I'm not sure if it will be Mr. Hansen or Mr. Akeem that can answer it. Uh, we had a lot of snow about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and I started getting phone calls um, in the evening and the next day about the fact that the skidoos were all over our um, Tom Lannan complex. Is there something that we can do? I, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm not sure if there is anything we can do. I mean, I've already told them they have to call the police. The police will come in, and we have signs that indicate no motorized vehicles allowed. But at the same time, they were all over the place, and they were there. And one individual indicated to me that they were there till 2 o'clock in the morning because they, they finally got snow, so they took out the skidoos and just went crazy. Um, one of his concerns is the, is the fact that we're going to have to have a lot of repairs on the fields if this continues because although we got snow, we didn't get a lot of it. We just got enough for them to slide around a bit, but that's going to damage the fields. No matter what we do, it's going to damage the fields. And that was his concern. I, it, he indicated that he thought maybe we should put a bunch of snow fences in a certain way so that it wouldn't make it easy for them to slide through, but I'm not sure that's the answer either. So um, can I, I, I just, I would like to leave it with you to see what can be done um, and be prepared next time we have snow. Uh, if, if that means getting hold of the police and having them sit around and wait for these guys, if they were, they were out last time, they're going to be out again, guaranteed. And, and, and we can be ready for them and make sure that they are aware that that is against the law here in Port Coburn. Because if we're not careful, we're going to wind up seeing them eventually at H.H. Knoll and other large parks that we have that allow them to slide all over the place and that makes it dangerous for anyone else that would like to take part in, in park activities. So just leave it with you. Thank you, Councillor Doucette. Uh, anyone else? Come on, you guys. Vance is not going to let me keep this job if you don't do this. The only thing I'd like to say at this time, uh, we had a really good uh, Christmas parade there a couple weeks ago, and... Uh, I believe we had about 60 floats in it, and uh, just a little shout out to Harry and Elena there for doing such a wonderful job. I had uh, some people from Welland complimenting on uh, how many floats we had in the parade, another lady from Fawn Hill, so uh, a big uh, congrats to everyone who attended, and uh, I know I was in it myself with the Main Street Merchants, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So think about it for next year. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, and uh, you can have a lot of fun, and it's nice to see all the people of Port Coburn out there. So. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Ron. Councillor uh, Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Just, uh, just to let the public know, there's one more chance to attend at Rose Lawn uh, for the um, Snowflakes and Musical Notes. We've had two events there the past two Sundays. The uh, last one was wonderful with a choral group there. And the next one is this coming Sunday, and it is the, uh, the jazz uh, series that's there. Um, sorry, I'm looking, uh, Twilight Jazz Ensemble, 
featuring Juliet Dunn and Peter Shea. And I believe there's still some tickets available, so uh, if you'd like to come out, please come out and support us. It'll be a wonderful event. Thank you. Nothing else, uh, folks? Okay. Uh, any staff responses to previous council inquiries? Nothing, eh? Okay. Turn the page. Uh, I guess I'll leave here now. Okay. Okay. At this time, I'd like to read the adoption of the minutes of the 26th regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole, November 25th, 2013. Can I have uh, uh, Councillor Damaris and Councillor Kenny? Okay, all, in all in favor? So much. Thank you. All right. We're moving. We're learning as we're going. Okay. Uh, consideration of items requiring separate discussion. Uh, I guess we'll start with item two. Item two B. That was yours. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Department of Chief Administrative Officer, Special Projects and Corporate Strategic Initi Initiatives, Report Number 2013-06. Subject, possible extension of rail service to the industrial zone southeastern lands along the Welland Canal. That City Council approves the submission of our Rural Economic Development Program application to conduct a business case study on, one, an, an intermodal facility to be located on the currently zoned industrial land located on the southerly end of the Welland Canal's east side an extension of the east side rail lines to an area to service such a facility, and the potential options for further west side canal rail line extensions to service and promote growth to the adjacent area. Second. Second. Okay. A second of that, Councillor Steele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just pulled, I actually pulled this report so to get some comments from our CAO. Um, I certainly was uh, really happy to see this on our agenda tonight and certainly hope that um, Council is going to support this um, full heartedly. This is a, an opportunity for us as, as, as Council to approve this um, work to get uh, this application in um, as we'll be able to access uh, funds from the province RED program which is the Rural Economic development program. And with the opportunity to um, access the provincial funds, we will have a comprehensive study done. And that will show that this type of transportation is viable in Port Coburn. Um, we'll get in, uh, from the report that you all got and, and read, you'll see that there's um, involvement, with, there will be involvement from the private sector. And this multi-model of delivery of products also gets support from the region. And mainly we get that support from the region because uh, of our location, and we're located at the perfect spot. So um, um, this through you, Deputy Mayor, to our CAO, if he could just um, add some comments, and, uh, and I know Council is going to support this uh, with no doubt. Thank you. Bob, would you like to speak? To your worship, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, the application has been a concerted effort on the part of the province providing us with lots of advice. We've met with the province a number of times with the Regional Municipality of Niagara, the Economic Development Department, um, is, uh, led by His Worship Mayor Badaway, and a number of, um, of local industry and business that have met to, to find ways to try to prepare the municipality as a port recognized um, in the Places to Grow legislation of the province of Ontario. It, this application, um, funded up as much as 90% by the province, um, will provide a study that will be used for further applications for, depending on the cost, um, federal and provincial grants for into the millions of dollars for development and construction of, of uh, railway, if in fact it's proven to be uh, um, of support and necessary for the further development of Port Coburn as a port. Um, right now, everybody that's been involved with it is quite excited because they can see that this is, really has some legs to it and will have some merit. 
This application right now, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is to provide uh, an opportunity to at least search out from the province to see if they will give us funding up to 90% of the funding, and we're estimating the report somewhere from 60 to 70 thousand dollars to have it uh, identified if in fact it proves that it's that it's worthwhile going after that study will form the basis for any future applications for uh, public private partnership a, a p3 uh, for the development of uh, of the port thank you mr isle All in favor, right? anybody else want to speak on the uh, item or All in favor? Yep. All in favor? Thanks so much. Okay, uh, I guess we'll move on to item seven, uh, Councillor Steele and B as well, or Councillor Kenny. Okay, yep. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'll move Department of Community and Corporate Services, Community Services, Division Report Number 2013-38, Subject, uh, Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival 2013, Post-Event Report. The Council receives the 2013 Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival Report for information. Any seconder to that? Thank you, Councillor Doucette. questions yep. Councillor Steele. thank you uh, deputy mayor um, just one uh, comment I'd like to read with regards to page 78 of uh, basically the paragraph and I think this sums up um, a lot of questions most people have and what misinformation is out of, without out in within the community as far as how canal days operates and and uh, and how well it does each year uh, basically it says financially the 2013 festival operated with a budget of $502,600. Overall revenues exceeded budget amount to $549,752, and expenditures amounted to $547,012. Overall, the event saw a savings of $2,739.90. Attributed to higher revenues, uh, see attached financial report, uh, uh, and, re and revenue targets were met in sponsorship and donations and exceeded uh, in-bar revenues. In addition, the festival received approximately 103,000 of in-kind sponsorship to various contributions. Uh, this year, the festival did not receive provincial grant money, as in the past, which has totaled 75,000 annually. The city as a whole contributed 25,000, which has decreased from the 35,000 in 2011. <coughs> from the city budget, and approximately 89,000 in staff time contributed to Canal Day's event for total city investment of 114,000. Without the tireless community, uh, or tireless commitment of de and dedication of the volunteers, providing more than 7,500 hours, according to approximately 105,000 in staff savings, the Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival will not be successful. I bring this forward to the fact that I know um, our staff this year, um, Harry and his uh, department worked very hard to keep expenditures down, uh, think outside the box, how else, uh, how, what other things can we do to bring uh, funding in, not just in dollars, but in in-kind, um, uh, uh, things from different companies and, 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 and on the staff side, the volunteer side. Uh, I know they worked hard with our staff in order to keep our uh, costs down there. Although some of those costs are already in the budget as most some of those day staff would be working anyways, but on weekends when it's uh, normally overtime. So I do have to congratulate staff for, for uh, putting forward this. Um, and it does show a savings of $2,739 as opposed to any losses. So again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Councillor Kenny, did you want to say something as well? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I was very pleased to see us uh, actually make a profit, make money instead of lose money. Um, and uh, right, staff, a lot of that has to go to uh, um, staff and their hard work. I just wanted to ask uh, Peter one question, Peter, in regards to the budget. And um, I know you and your administrative expenses, um, but in 2011, uh, administrative expenses was uh, listed here in our financial report. That's page 80 uh, of our report. Administrative expenses were $17,469, and the actual amount in 2013 was $1,414. Quite a difference, Peter. 17000 to 1400 
So I wondered if you could kind of explain to me how that fell so drastically. Page 80 of the report. Thanks. To you, um, distracting Deputy Mayor. Um, in 2011, the main difference uh, in, the, in the increase in the cost was the economic uh, impact assessment study that was done, and that was approximately $15,458, and that was the uh, additional expense in that year to, for that uh, study. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Ron, did you want some? Okay, Mr. Heil. Worship, just to... Um, the mayor, that the only, the only, the real point of that study was too, is that identified that there was over two million dollars, brand new money, pumped into the city of Port Colborne during the Canal Days event, and in total, um, monies that were spent as a result of Canal Days, not not all new money, two two million dollars plus new, and a little over four point eight million dollars spent for over seven million dollars economic, uh, economic uh, driver stemming from Canal Days in the city of Port Coburn. Thank you, Mr. Heil. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Acting Deputy Mayor. Um, certainly, uh, Harry and his team uh, had a lot to do with uh, the success of this, but I'd also like to, to uh, commend the Canal Days Committee that, uh, that worked very hard, and I know there's at least one member of that committee sitting out there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that at that committee, we, we thought we would at least uh, try to ensure that it broke even. But, uh, you know, through, uh, through good luck and good management and good weather, uh, things, uh, you know, things actually did, uh, did come through. So, Peter, I know I grilled you uh, before on this, but, uh, you know, the skeptic would say, yeah, but you didn't put everything in there, you know? Like, no, you didn't charge this or you didn't charge that. And I know we had that conversation. And... I'd just like you to acknowledge again that, yes, we did put all the expenses in there, that we're not hiding anything. These are true pictures. And, uh, and this is actually the, uh, you know, we didn't get creative with numbers or anything. This is actually what happened. And uh, congrats to everybody that was involved. But uh, Peter, I'd just like you to confirm that that's uh, actually the case. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, so all the expenditures are the actual expenditures of Canal Day's direct uh, third-party expenditures that, have, uh, that are in this report. Um, the staff time is approximately $89,000 of staff time. Majority of that staff time being, um, being over the four-day four -day event with uh, public work staff, parks, uh, administrative staff, uh, community services staff um, that are all included in there and includes overtime also. And um, obviously, you know, staff uh, do work on canal days all year round. And uh, my time, probably every staff in City Hall spends some time, some time, somewhere uh, on canal days. And, uh, but the majority of the, of the expense is, is during that weekend. And, um, and that's all part of this, this uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Sines. So uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, uh, Councilor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, what a nice, refreshing change of usually a twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars kick in the pants to ending up in uh, the black. So just well done, everybody. It's just so nice to see this come forward. Thank. You. Thank you, Councilor Butters. Any else? Any other questions? Or uh, we're all set. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Okay, uh, item eight, uh, Councillor Steele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll move Department of Community and Corporate Services, Community Services Division Report Number 2013-39, subject advertising opportunities at the Valet Health and Wellness Center. Uh, the staff prepares the appropriate policies and procedures for all forms of advertising, including a fee structure that will attract potential clients to receive advertising exposure based on three to five year time frame. Included for each advertising arrangement will be the appropriate agreement that will bind both the party, both parties uh, on mutually beneficial terms and conditions. That staff investigates every opportunity for potential advertising and opportunities to generate revenue from the following. 
dasher rink boards in one or both rinks, wall space advertising boards in one or both rinks, video monitor advertising nine units, ticker tape advertising on the video monitor, outdoor pylon VHWC and static display board at Westside Arena, or former Westside Arena, Westside Road now, uh, advertising cover wrap around video monitors, uh, nine to 12 units, rink dividers, glass graphics, recycle waste container advertising wraps, panel advertising in washrooms and elevator, arena player bench advertising four, arena steps advertising, ice surface uh, machine advertising two units, hockey, lacrosse, goal net posts. Thank you, Councillor Steele. <coughs> Seconder for that, please. Councillor Bodner. Would you like to speak on this as well, Councillor Steele? Yes, uh, Acting Deputy Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I, I do like the report. I like um, what the uh, what staff is doing with regards to uh, the Valley Health and Wellness Center. Obviously, with with an all-inclusive facility like we have compared to the old facilities uh, and limited space in the old facilities, uh, we could do a lot more here. The only uh, two issues I do have uh, with this report is with regards to the. Uh, uh, list of areas uh, that we uh, that I read with regards to dasher rink boards in one or both rinks, wall space advertising boards in one or both rinks. Um, during the public committee process to build this facility, um, the committee uh, looked uh, long and hard at the types of advertising within the facility. Many of these came up, video monitors, the ice resurfacing machine, we were able to secure the hockey net uh, goal post, uh, things of that nature. Um, what the committee looked at and, uh, and took in um, comments from, from other arenas, other areas, you know, the general uh, uh, public, was the fact that how can we actually make it a cleaner looking facility? Um, so the, the committee itself went to on-ice advertising, which is what's in the Valley Health Wellness Center now for the two rinks. We do have four advertisements on the upper uh, board area which surrounds the, the inner section that surrounds the walking track um, which was really against what was passed here at council with regards to that. Council received a report from the committee and uh, ratified that report with the regards to uh, specifically the arenas. I know the pools and the gymnasium were going to be looked at at a later time but specifically on the arena side we wanted to stay away from that. There were several reasons. Um, when, Brian El when Brian Elliott was with the city we talked about rink board advertising and that certain events that you may may or may not want to bring in or, or or you should try to be bringing in a lot of those rink advertisings have to be taken down because of uh in the case of niagara falls they had tsn or sportsnet ontario that come in and videotape they actually go out and sell advertising for their event when they rent our facility and they actually put different advertising up the city of niagara falls had a real problem that the fact that the rink board advertising there on new style boards isn't the old style where there's a slide in slide out where you have a sheet of plastic that's drilled into your into your boards like we used to at the West Side Arena. It's an actual sticker that goes on and they had a real hard time and they had to pay for that themselves to take off. So that's why we stayed away from that. Since this facility is open we've ran a number of uh, quite large tournaments. Last year our first real big tournament was uh, 40 Reminder Hockey, uh, rented our facility for two days had teams from all over Ontario. Uh, they hosted the um, Alliance uh, Hockey Association, which is a uh, sister of the OMHA. Uh, they do run separately, but they're all under Hockey Canada and hockey, uh, the Ontario Hockey Federation. Big comments that I received was how clean and crisp our facility looked. People did like the on-ice advertising. Um, if you go to other facilities, you'll see, and I was at three different arenas on the weekend, you'll see advertising on the boards, and then you'll go back a year later half of it's gone, bunch, there's a bunch of blank spaces. To me, it doesn't look right. The Gale Center is a perfect example of that. After the first two years of, of that, they actually lost quite a bit of advertising. You go there today, there's a lot of empty spaces. My comment on this is, I think we should follow the original uh, recommendation from the committee, stick to the on ice for now. I know there's four advertisements, which the Deputy Mayor actually has a conflict with because his is, <laughs> happens to be one of them uh, yeah well, to, be, to be quite honest uh, Councilor Bonner I, I would I would take all four down nothing against the businesses and I think as the mayor has stated in the past we must add color to the facility but again let's get in there let's figure out how the facility is going to live and breathe and how that color is going to be made 
you've got minor hockey, you've got a junior B team, you've got uh, now the Wave Girls Hockey uh, Association, which is a, a part of Port Coral Minor Hockey. Uh, hopefully we get a skating club in here at some point uh, if we attract lacrosse in the summer. You're going to have those organizations wanting to put their logos up uh, in working in conjunction with Harry and his staff. Um, so I'd hate to see us throwing all kinds of stuff up there that looks just confusing as heck. So I would ask that those two uh, points in the report be, be omitted at this time and that we maintain the original report that came forward from the uh, Health and Wellness uh, Public Committee. Um, allow staff to go out and find other things. I agree. There are things that we can do in our facility, specifically with the TV monitors. We should be uh, attracting more money there. Um, and to kind of sum this up, my biggest thing is that I really don't want to go out and uh, I'm trying to think of the right word that I can use. I'll use the word prostitute because I used that word before our facility just to make a buck that we should go out and just slap things on our facility. I think we have to really take a good uh, plan of action with all the areas um, and how we want our past to be seen in the facility, our current uh, facility, and then what may lay ahead for the future. So I, I'm not in favor of that. Harry, believe me, in all the tournaments that I've been at, we had the Golden Puck this year. But people cannot believe Pork Overton has such a beautiful facility like this. We have teams from all over Ontario for Golden Puck. And time and time again, it's people that say how nice and clean and crisp it looks. I just don't want to bastardize this thing. I, you know, it's not, a, it's not a big advertising bulletin board where people are going to stick stuff all over. You know, I think we really need to take a, a step back on some of this stuff. TV screens are fine, wrapping garbage pails. We have the two Zambonis, which we have uh, David Chevrolet on, uh, on now. We have ice advertising. I think the pool and the gymnasium, we can start doing some things there. Um, but I really want to uh, make sure that we do this right and not just to be mess it all up. So those two I would ask to be uh, stricken from this report. Uh, the rest are, are fine uh, the way I look. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. <coughs> Thank you. I want to say something about Can I, Mr. Heil, please. Just a quick note of clarification, uh, Deputy Mayor, is that um, when we were pulling this report together, we were aware of the policy that, and the recommendation from, from the design committee that said, you know, let's stay away from the rinks and the walls. Um, the only reason it's in here is because this has to come back to council. Um, staff were looking at every opportunity for advertising. Hence, that's the only reason it's on there. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. If council directs it to come off today, that's fine. We just wanted to, to fill it in so that you know fully what opportunities there are out there. The, the, the cost of operating the building right now, we're probably $100,000 just over what we had budgeted. So we're, it, it, it's, it's costing uh, more in, you know, those, in some of that. So we're just trying to look at ways to maximize the revenue on it. And this was one. It comes back to this table in any event. Thank you, Mr. Heil. Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I have a question regarding the, um, the advantages and disadvantages to managing um, this advertising uh, by a third party. And, it's, and I understand that our, our, we went to a third party uh, company that the, you know, an RFP would be required. But by the same token, if we did have a third-party company come in and do that, wouldn't they be kind of aggressively beating the bushes for the um, people that would advertise in that facility? And, and if that's the case, who, who's going to be task, who's going to have that task if we keep this in-house? Because what I don't want to see happen is, um, you know, another, yet another job is added on to you know, the plate of, I would s assume, Mr. Hakeem, <laughs> uh, which is probably fairly full as it is. And then I, I just want to make sure that if it goes this route, who's going to be actually beating those bushes to um, get those advertisers um, into our facility? Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Councillor Butters. Uh, Councillor Kenny? No, I want to want an answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to Mr. Hakeem, could you possibly uh, speak on that? Uh, through your uh, acting uh, deputy mayor to Councillor Butters. Um, <coughs> the report really outlined a collaborative effort. I mean, the third party element is still doable, the RFP process, but it'll definitely give us a, a less return 
uh, past experience in other facilities and other communities where we've had to manage, where staff have had to manage a third party aggressively beating the bushes to get a few hundred dollars a month on any form of advertising really didn't pan out. The city here is fortunate to have invested in a position, corporate sponsorship position, that currently works in that vein. And so we discussed, you know, just loosely that uh, we would certainly set up a collaborative where if that person is actually out there working on sponsorship, there are so many other opportunities that we can tie in with that effort. So it would, it would actually need to be coordinated, create a strategy, and perhaps realizing a greater return if that person was out there working. Now, it would involve other staff as well. We've also invested in the software applications that will help us put information up on those monitors remotely. So we have certain capabilities that perhaps other communities may not have invested in that we did at the front end. So we're handling things like community ads. As long as they come to us prepared in a format that we require, and we can set all those parameters up. But that's where this report is critical. So what direction are we going to go? What direction would you like us to take? Obviously, with the first two off the, the books right now, at this point in time, we have to dig deeper and find out where those other avenues are going to be. But we would certainly have parameters in place and probably work as a, as a team to, to solicit, perhaps capture that information. But we want specific terms, specific conditions. So you as an advertiser would come to us with a finished product. We'd get it up there. This is our pricing scheme, so on and so forth. So I think we can, I'm confident we can do it as, as a group, though, as a collaborative group with existing resources. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Akeem. Councillor Kenny, you want to say something? Right, thank you, <coughs> Deputy Mayor. Um, I would kind of like to echo some of Councillor Steele's comments. And, in regards to the uh, rink boards, uh, either in the in the big, uh, you know, I, either one of them. I, I don't want to see the advertising on there. I, I like the way it looks. Um, Councillor Steele's in the arena probably way more than me. I like the warm side. Thank you very much. I like to be warm, so I'm on that side more than I'm on the uh, the arena side. But I I really like that that clean look. Um, it looks great. Um, and I don't like to see it. I would like not for that not to happen, the rink boards at all. I think that was the, uh, as uh, Councillor Still said, that was the committee, the original plan, the original view of our, our center, and I think that we should uh, stick with that. Thank you. I guess we'll uh, go to Councillor Damaris. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, I just I would also like to echo Councillor Steele's comments. Um, I was privileged in, in being a, both a public and a council member of that committee. Um, during the uh, term on the committee, uh, council was elected and I got to switch sides. Um, and I can tell you that that committee worked long and hard to make sure that they nailed down every detail of that complex. And they were really clear that uh, these advertisements should be contained and uh, to keep a good look on the building. And I think that uh, we owe it to the committee and the work they did and to the city to, to keep this up. We've got a beautiful facility and I think we need to keep it that way. Thank you, Council Demers. Councilor Steele. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I'll just move or I'll make an amendment to the motion. I'll move that the Dasher uh, rink board in one or both the rinks and wall space advertising <coughs> boards in one or both rinks be stricken and that we follow the current policy of the city of Port Comer. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Can I get a seconder for that? Councillor Doucette. Okay, so we'll have a little vote on the amendment there. Uh, which way we're going to go on this? Uh, as far as uh, my sign being up in the arena, <laughs> it's a lovely sign. I was approached by uh, Mr. Elliott at that time, and uh, I, I consider myself fortunate to be one of the advertisers in there, one of the few advertisers. Uh, I uh, attend that arena every Friday night uh, to play hockey on a personal note, and uh, it is a clean facility. It's a wonderful facility. Um, we've got nothing to be ashamed of, and uh, advertising is what goes on, and uh, your advertising dollar can be spent in a lot of ways, whether you want to mail it into somebody or uh, stick it on a wall and uh, promote your business or your uh, personal uh, lifestyle. So I don't know, mixed feelings for sure, but uh, we'll move along from there. So we'll make an amendment to that. 
So we'll call that question on the amendment if we're going to all in favor or all opposed. So I guess we'll go to this main motion as amended. That was the word, I guess. I'm going to be so smart. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I got lots. Yeah. <laughs> I brought my pen. Okay, so we move along. You gotta take a vote. So we'll have a vote on the uh, motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Bowdner. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Hakeem. Mr. Hakeem, there was um, a number of people that, um, well, two or three that approached me after the, we canceled the amount of signs we're putting up around after Frank's sign got up. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, but did we keep track of who those people were? Do we have a list of people that wanted to advertise and couldn't? And if we do have that list, can they be approached first uh, as maybe some other form of advertising rather than have, they're all local people and uh, I just wondered if that list existed and I think they should have first kick at the can um, at least to say yes or no if we do have that list, so I'd just like you to Mr. Hakeem. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Bodner. Uh, we do, and we kept that list active, actually. We have approximately half a dozen or so inquiries that have come forward, and we're still fielding calls. In fact, even through the um, corporate uh, sponsorship office, I think we, we had gathered some information. So we do have that information, and we'll just follow up with them with the direction that we're getting, and uh, hopefully convince them to uh, work with us. Okay, then uh, I guess we'll ask uh, Harry and his clan to go out and uh, call the question on the motion that uh, we won't be having those couple uh, lines in there and uh, see what you can do with this and uh, report back to us at a later date. So we'll call the vote at this time. All in favor? All opposed? Motion's carried. Okay. I guess we'll go to item 14 uh, B uh, or Councillor Kenny please mm -hmm. yeah. thank you deputy mayor uh, Department of Planning and Development report number 2013-78 subject recommendation report for a zoning bylaw amendment file number D 14-01-13-250 West Side Road one, that the Council of the City of Port Coburn only approves the zoning bylaw attached hereto as Appendix A, rezoning the land from the existing R1 First Density Residential to R1-374H Single Detached Holding Development Agreement, uh, agreement and R3-375H Semi Detached Holding Development Agreement. Two, that the Council not approve the proposed zoning change from R1 First Density Residential to R4 density residential and neighborhood commercial due to the lack of supporting studies for staff review, making the application incomplete. Once again, and three, that the city clerk is hereby authorized and directed to proceed and giving of notice of passing of the bylaw in accordance with the Planning Act. Four, pursuant to the provisions of section 3417 of the Planning Act, no further notice of public meeting be required. Uh, we're going to ask Mr. Heil to speak on the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we need a seconder on that. So, okay, we'll take uh, Councillor Demers. And we'd ask Mr. Heil to speak on this, if we could. Just quickly, Your Worship, there's a, there is a request before you tonight that was distributed by the clerk. Yeah, I was going there, to speak to that. Oh, okay. that's okay. Thanks, that's sorry, okay. sorry. That's okay. Live and learn. So. I, ju I, I just wanted to say once again, we get an incomplete application. Um, if you look at everything that's said, the staff, are, the staff tells you in the whole report um, that um, they still don't have um, studies that they had asked for, um, so they can't make any comments. And then as late as today, today, we got this. Yes. Where, where can I begin? Mr. Aquilina. Further to directions from the shareholders, we ask that council adjourn the December 9th meeting 
and revise the application as shown on sketch two, attached here too. The concerns are the holding provision, insufficient details of the proposed development, lack of response to items A through D, outlining December 6, 2013th letter. In response to the letter from the planning on, on December 6, in addition, engineering information requested from the city is unavailable to complete the site servicing study in a timely manner. So, so this developer is once again pointing the finger at us. Uh, I'll go on to read, the letter has been, uh, it says the density has been decreased to make for a simplified infrastructure and to comply with the regional and municipal official plan to provide subsidized affordable housing. Then it goes, if council is willing to provide a clear set of instructions, cost to be incurred, it is possible that a further review of the original proposal could be financially viable. At this time, three units planning is proposing to be approved would not be viable, as again, the items requested have been detailed addressed. In summary, the shareholders feel that the site has paid sufficient taxes since 1960, a sewer and water surcharge since 1996, and should be compensated for this. Nor do they wish to build a road and infrastructure for the benefit of the abutting landowners. After site inspection by the shareholders, and it shows the, some photos attached, um, they said you can see a garage uh, having a driveway leading nowhere, trailers parked in it, said driveway, an abandoned tarp car. What the developer here is doing is pointing fingers at the um, community that's already established there. So I would move that we, once again, because this is incomplete, that we take his request and that we uh, adjourn his application until he brings us. Thank you. So at this time, I guess I would ask for a motion to defer this, uh, if that's what the... You better listen Unless to it is. defer, right? Oops, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so you're asking for a deferral. He's asking to be adjourned. Councillor Boner. Acting Deputy Mayor, I wonder whether we could hear from the planner. There may be some some way we should word this or something like that, I don't know. Or Mr. Heil said, we gotta get this right or we can be, you know, kind of messed up slightly. So let's, I think the planner might have some thought process on this. Okay, so we're gonna ask, ask Mrs. Craig to give us a uh, direction on this as far as the motion to defer. Is that what motion to defer. Motion to defer. Procedural bylaw on a motion to defer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, for clarification purposes, Councillor Kenny, were you um, moving a motion for deferral? So, sorry, uh, Madam Clerk. No, I'm not, because he's asking us, I believe, Mr. Aquilina, is he not asking us to um, do more work again when the, the really the onus is on the developer, not on the city of Percover? And he's still bringing us incomplete applications, like. Um, we all heard on the first, when we first brought this, when the first planning meeting, um, all the residents that in, in that area uh, talking about his plan to rezone this. All around, you got, you all have the same report. 123 of the report shows all, all around there, except for the Port Cove Mall, it's zoned R1, first density, R1, R1, and the, of course, except for the, and once again, he's, he, the applicant has changed the proposed rezoning and site plan of the property numerous times, numerous times. How many emails did you get? 500 and something from him? Is it around 500, is that not correct? And, and since July, since that July public meeting, the applicant has submitted several more proposals. Once again, even in your report, it says 
Staff cannot properly review and adequately consider or address the proposed rezoning because Mr. Pinelli has not submitted any and is requesting counsel to make a decision in absence of them. And this is one counselor that will not make a decision on that. No. Sorry. I think if we could ask Mr. Acalina to say something on this. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And it's where do I start, members of council? Uh, once again, we have a request, um, and that's in response to the recommendation report, which is recommending council deny all the changes proposed aside from the two single family lots on the east side of the property, one being recommended to be changed to semi detached. The recommendation report, because of the lack of studies for us to properly review what's being proposed, we recommend that council deny that as part of the application. In response to our report, you now see this letter that I received today at 1.25 p.m. And again, you now have another request to have another proposal to be submitted and reviewed. Again, having more staff time to look into the application and what is being proposed. Another totally change of the application. Members of council, my recommendation was that you only approve the two lots on the east side of the property subject to a holding provision, subject to a development agreement being executed that would require Mr. Pinelli, Pinelli to extend the road across the frontage of those two lots and to extend with full municipal services. The development agreement would ensure that that is done. And members of council, deputy mayor, that, that's what I recommend to council. And if you do not do that, um, it's just going to go around and around and again more staff time another thing that I should remind council of, or should inform council of it's not in the report Mr. Pinelli has actually appealed the fact that council has not made a decision on his application to the Ontario Municipal Board that appeal was received in November um, the act requires council to make a decision within a prescribed time he's appealed that to the OMB the OMB has now received that appeal and they need to uh, set, it, set a date. That was going to be mentioned in the report that I'm going to have to council in January dealing with all the other OMB appeals that we have received. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Aquilina. Mr. Aquilina, with regards to the roadway, um, so in essence, your recommendation here this evening uh, brings it over to R1, which Councillor Kenny spoke on earlier. Um, it also sets in motion that that road be completely built from where it stops on Franklin all the way to West Side Road, correct? Through Deputy Mayor to Councillor Steele, no, no, that's incorrect. Two things. The two lots that I'm recommending to be approved, one would be for a single family home. The second one could be for a single family home or for a semi-detached home. But the recommendation through the development agreement would only require the road to be constructed across the two easterly lots and to a dead end and there would be a cul-de-sac that would be required for turning purposes that would be on the road allowance of Franklin Avenue but that would only be just west of the two lots that I recommend to council so through you deputy mayor so in essence if if this developer then decides to open up the remainder of the lots he's gonna have to if he would have to open up the cul-de-sac and start extending. Would that be correct? Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Steele, if Council makes the decision, and that decision is final and binding, and there's no OMB appeal, Mr. Pinelli would have to come back to Council with a new application to propose any new land use to the west of those two lots, which at that time, the application would not be considered until all those studies are actually in our hands and in place. Okay, thank you, Mr. Racklina. Um, the problem I have with this, and I, and I stated this back in one of the original public meetings we had here, um, is the fact that I don't want to see this road partially built, then another chunk added, another chunk added. We've got pipes in the ground that have all kinds of connections. I want to see this. If this road is supposed to go from the dead end where it currently sits to West Side Road, that it be built all at once so that we as a city years down the line after Ron is retired his person that comes in and takes him 
his job has to go in and fix all the breaks. I mean, it'll be a mess. To me, putting connection after connection after connection when you're, you know, it's just a, it, I mean, again, like the 11th hour, it's changed again. I mean, Mr. Aquilino, where, where's the, where does the city stand on this when they can basically tell a developer, no, we're, we're, we're done at this? Like, how, how many kicks of the can? Does this guy get to do this <laughs> forever? Through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Steele, unfortunately, the, yes, that is correct. If an application can come back to Council, it could be in a different form, but eventually it needs to come to Council for an ultimate decision, it, and it's up to the Council to decide whether or not you want to support and approve that development, no matter who the developer is. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. And, and I know I know the conundrum we can be in is if, is if we delay things and he wants to go to the OMB. I mean, to be quite honest, the whole thing is laughable. It's just the way it changes it, it, uh, almost on the hour, how he's complaining about a letter of December 6th. Well, today's only the 9th. That was sent Friday, and this is Monday. How answers can be given over a weekend when staff aren't working? I don't understand that. So I'm really having a tough time with this. I have no problem on, on you know, finally getting the thumb down and making him proceed according to what we want to see in a development, which is our one, which again, Councillor Kenny mentioned earlier. But I still have a problem with this road. It, it's either going to be built correctly, or not, to me, not built at all. I mean, I just, I just don't want to see the taxpayer of Port Coburn getting stuck on a development that's improperly done. And to me, this is, it's just not going the right way. So, you know, if there's a way that, that you know, if you're saying it's going to be cul de sac but what's stopping that from being blown through again 10 years from now? I, I, you know, where's the protection to the city and to the, and to the city taxpayer on picking up bills from a, from a poor development? That's, that's the real concern I have here, is the future, not, you know, today we can control what we have today. But if that cul-de-sac goes in and that's the end of it, I have no problem with that. I could support this. But I want assurances that this road and water, sewer, stormwater are all put in properly at the first time, not continually down the line. So at this point, I'm not sure if I'm going to support this. Councillor Butters. I, uh, two things. Um, whoever develops it, don't they have to build the road? Would that be kind of my first question to uh, Mr. Aquilina? Mr. Aquilina. Through Deputy, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Butters, correct. And the development agreement or whatever it be, a subdivision agreement would ensure that that road and servicing is built properly. Okay, so that would take care of Councillor Steele's um, Concern, would you say? Through you, Deputy Mayor, yes, that agreement, and there would be financial uh, securities we would hold on to to ensure that it is done properly. Yes. Or you're not going to get a building permit for anything. Okay. And my second um, well, question, I suppose, is if um, th this has been applied to to go to the OMB, um, I'm going to suggest that we might not want the OMB deciding the fate of this. Um, application that we might want to be deciding that ourselves, not the OMB. Thank you. Councillor Bodner. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you. Um, I, I can uh, see where Councillor Steele's coming from with the, with the full road, but I think, do we not have an obligation um, if Mr. Pennelly has brought this application forward for the two lots does council not have an obligation or planning or someone to proceed in a manner that would seem reasonable and reasonable to me would seem that he has to then just do the road in front of those two lots and the sewer is there some onus on the city that we should act in a reasonable manner whether we like the situation or not rather than force him to put in the whole road just for two lots I'm just looking at what would what would seem reasonable if it did if this little section went to the OMB? So I wonder if you could comment on that. Mr. Aquilina, through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Bodner. The first issue is Mr. Pinelli has an application for the entire property. Mr. Pinelli has not provided the required studies that could support development of the entire property. That that is the, the first issue. The second issue the recommendation is only approving the two lots on the east of the property, subject to a holding provision and subject to a development agreement to then ensure that development of those two lots is done properly along the service and built, paved, 
road. Go ahead, Ron. <clears throat> Just to follow up on that, then this doesn't give him a, if if we approve this tonight, it doesn't give him a building permit. It doesn't give him nothing until he comes through with the sewer and road built or money up front to build that. Um, that would be the first step before he would even consider getting a permit for those two, the single family and the singular double. Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councilor Bonner. If Council approves the recommendation tonight, it's subject to the holding provision. The next step is for Mr. Pinelli and the city to enter into a development agreement. Once that is done, it would then come back to Council to lift the holding provision and then require Mr. Pinelli to develop that road, put in the servicing, then once that is done to the city's satisfaction, then he could then apply for a building permit to build on those two lots and just those two. <clears throat> I know I got my own feelings on how you build things. And so, not quite sure if I understand what his intentions are. I think right now, oh, sorry, Councilor Doucette. I just have a, a technical question and, and, and I don't know who can answer it. If the developer who we are making a decision on right now is saying, I don't want this to go on, do we have a legal obligation to say he doesn't want it to go on so let's just drop it or can we make this decision and move on um, so it, it's 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 a concern of mine in that I want to make sure that we're not caught in a catch-22 and this almost sound almost seems to me like a catch-22 where we're going to approve something that he's asked us not to move on to do uh, so can anyone answer that question for me? I, I don't know if there's an answer even, but I, I'd, I'd like to at least have someone attempt. Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Doucette, what we have is an application for a zoning change that was submitted by Mr. Pinelli. We've had two public meetings before Council. We now have a recommendation that is asking Council to only approve the two lots and deny everything to the west. We have an OMB, OMB appeal right now from Mr. Pinelli. That's, that's still there. That can't go away. If council does anything with the two lots, that's not going to put Mr. Pinelli nor the city in a position, or I should speak for the city's sake, it's not going to put the city in a position that we've done something that was not just. You are making a decision under the Planning Act. Mr. Pinelli will have then the option to then appeal once again or piggyback on his existing appeal with what council has just decided this evening. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Mr. Aquilina, based on today's umpteenth sketch we've received, it's, it's, it's showing, um, and I'm only using this for reference purposes, it's showing a phase one R3 zoning and then a phase two R2 zoning, R, or sorry, RT zoning. So what I'm here to understand from you is that this phase one lot would only be a single family home where he's showing a, a semi-detached on what your on your proposal. So the lot on, on his phase one R3 is really on yours phase one R1 single family, is that correct? Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Steele. I would think that what you see phase one on his drawing is larger in size than the single family lot that is before council this evening because you're not going to, you know, it's showing a semi. There's no dimensions on the sketch, so I can't confirm what the dimensions are of the phase one as opposed to what is before you this evening of his proposal. Well, for, again, for reference purposes only, if we're looking at this map, is I'm going to go back to my earlier comment with regards to this road. If indeed we pass this and all we're saying is you've got to build the road to the end of the second building, which in this case I assume is the, is the uh, semi-detached building, that would take us into part of what's on this 
diagram uh, counselors into phase two. That's my concern is that the road stops there. When he wants to go into all these other phases and everything else he's got drawn on here, why are we not telling this developer that the road has to go through? Like what we're saying is, okay, you can take two lots, put a road in. What if he comes back here and asks for two more lots, then we extend the road two more? I, I really have a concern with that. Most developments in the, this community, when they're done at large, I, I'll look at uh, uh, Lester Schultz Limited, the estates at the end of Clarence Street. All those streets and services were all put in at the same time. He didn't go in and sell a couple lots, put a road in, sell a couple lots, put a road in. They were all developed at the same time. You look at Shamrock Subdivision. Again, that whole subdivision was put in at the same time that the lots were sold after. To me, going in piecemealing this it, it, it is not good development within the city of Port Colborne. It will cost the taxpayers down the road. I've talked to staff before when you have all these connections on services, not a good thing. So, you know, that the pipe should go from point A where it stops now out to West Side Road if that's the end of that pipe, not have X amount of connections in between. So can you just confirm to me that if, if in your recommendation, what we're telling him is that he can build the road two lots and that's it, he'll have to call the sack it and then have to come back to us for his next phase at whatever point in the future, that's where he can extend the road again. I just want to confirm that. Or does he have to build from Franklin to West Side Road now? Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Steele. If you look to page 130 of the report, and I believe Mr. Heil has that right now, the road would be developed for the two easterly lots. If Mr. Pinelli is going to then move forward with the development for the remainder of the lots, at that time, the requirement from the city would be to actually push that road right through to West Side Road. At that time, we would require, if that is coming back to Council in the future, with all the supporting studies in place, then our requirement would be for Mr. Pinelli to actually then construct that road, subject to Council's approval, to construct that road right to West Side Road. Full servicing, full municipal standard of that road. Deal. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Through you to Mr. Ackliner. Thank you. What's stopping us from doing that today? Making that road a properly constructed, with all its services, go from the dead end of Franklin now to West Side Road. Through Deputy Mayor to Councilor Steele, that would be a decision of Council to make to have that requirement on the two lots. Uh, we've heard many times before Mr. Pinelli is not willing to do that for many reasons. And one of the reasons I've always received from him, it's cost prohibitive of him to develop that road to only then have two lots developed. Can we make it a condition of your recommendation? Mm -hmm. Through your deputy mayor, it, it, it's a decision of council to make. So instead of having the development agreement to only require the road to be, to be built over the two frontages, Council could then make a decision to actually have that road built all the way through to West Side Road. That's yeah. But the thing about Bowdoin, Councillor Steele, is at this moment, once you actually have that road entering onto West Side Road, the MTO is going to want to see a full traffic impact study. We've just received that impact study. Just received it on the Friday. So I have no comments from the MTO whether or not that study is acceptable whether or not they require any signalization. So that, that's my only concern, is if we are approving that road, I would say if council is going to, council is going to go down that road, make that then subject to that same development agreement to then require that road fully built, subject to the MTO's review of the traffic impact study, and to have the proper securities in place to then develop that road. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Aquilina. I, I still have concern because knowing this developer, he'll be back asking for another lot. Extend. I, I, it just. I, I don't. I don't trust the developer on this whole thing. I mean, to be quite honest, if you're going to develop, you should have the money to develop. Everybody else does in this community that we've had. I, I've never seen a, other developers come forward like this developer with 
it seems problem or issue after issue with regards to how he's developing. To me, it's just not good development. And I can't support putting in partial po partial roadways in to keep to just keep coming back and, and chopping it and cutting it. To me, if you're going to develop it, develop it. No different than the other ones I mentioned earlier. Those developers came in and had a plan. They proceeded with it. Yeah, it takes money. We all know it takes money to develop. You know, you look at the people that develop this community, and we don't have a lot of subdivisions going in, but to be quite honest, I'll take the two newest, Shamrock and, and uh, at the end of Clarence Street, Lester Schultz Limited Subdivision, both done right. I don't believe we have a lot of problems in there. Mr. Hansen can answer that, but, you know, it took time for those houses to be sold, but that's what the developer did. He, he took money out of a bank to pay for that. I'm sure they were pretty big mortgages and paid them off as they sold lots. But again, they were all developed properly without it costing the taxpayer in the future a lot of money. And I just can just see it today down the road that we're going to be paying for poor decisions that we can make today. And I, I don't want to throw that on the taxpayer. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Councillor Steele. I got my own feelings on uh, the way things are done and should be done, of course. Um, I believe if you're going to develop it, uh, I have to agree with Councillor Steele, uh, put in the road, put in the pipes, put in the fire hydrants, put in everything. Um, I don't know. I'm going to... I'd like to uh, say uh, possibly uh, ask for a deferral at this time from Council and see what you want to do and have a vote, or do you want to just... Uh, I don't know. I mean... Uh, Go ahead, uh, Councillor DeMaris. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Uh, I would just like to um, hear from Mr. Heil on how we should regard this communication. Mr. Heil? Yes. <laughs> 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 Councillor Butter, Butter has appropriately answered the question. <laughs> okay, well, we've all got something else to write on. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll move or I'll uh, uh, make a motion. I'll make an amendment to this that uh, that this recommendation be accepted uh, with the addition that the road and all its services be put in uh, from the dead end of Franklin today to West Side Road, and all the appropriate <coughs> reports be submitted to staff to deal with the uh, MTO on that case. Just one sec. Go ahead, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Can we also add to that subject to the uh, MTO reports, as uh, Ms. Raquelina has suggested? Okay, thanks. So, what are we going to do here now? We're going to. Okay, so. Delegations first. Well, you need a seconder. So, seconder. So, Councilor DeMaris is getting seconder. And then we have some Gary speaking. I think we may want to ask the delegation if Gary wants to speak. Um, he had spoken to him now because they're dealing with it in the third half. We want to make sure the delegations. Okay. I know we have a delegation in the back there, and uh, Mr. Gavrilek, you are on the uh, agenda to speak, so if you would like to speak at this time. I think you know how to push the button and tell us where you live and whatnot. I finally learned that. Thank you. Gary Gavrilek, 21 Woodside Drive. That's the one there. <coughs> okay. Uh, Acting Mayor Danch, Councillor, City Staff. 
thank you for allowing us to voice our current concerns related to planning development report number 2013-78. I'll skip the rest of the preamble there. After reviewing the planning and development recommendation, it is our opinion that the proposed recommendation will not allay our concerns with respect to the residential character of our neighborhood. Our comments and concerns presented at both public information meetings dated July 22, 2013 and November 12, 2013 are quite clear, sincere, and a matter of record. Once again, for the record, we are not against development. However, this recommendation, as presented, is found to be, for the most part, unacceptable. Concern number one, non-completion of Franklin Avenue through to the West Side Road, Highway 58. At the onset of these discussions, it was, our, it was our understanding that the road allowance Franklin Avenue would have to be completed to the municipal standard through to West Side Road prior to the commencement of any further development. This recommendation now suggests allowing the applicant to only develop the road surface to the full municipal standard across the frontage of both lots in question with a further extension of the road surface to provide a turnaround for garbage collection and snow removal vehicles all in order to support the development of one R1 first density residential single family dwelling and one R3 third density two story semi detached dwelling. We view, this as allow we view this as allowing the applicant to develop the property in a piecemeal manner. We caution council that this may be perceived as a, pre a precedent setting in that this applica applicant may have an argument with respect to the application process with respect to further development of the lands in question. Other developers who may find themselves in a similar situation may take note. <coughs> Condition or standard of existing extension of Franklin Avenue, fronting 179 Franklin Avenue. It is our concern that the current extension of the paved road surface in front of 179 Franklin Avenue through to the road extending ending barricade east-west direction is not to the current municipal standard. We believe that that road surface in question was not paid to the municipal required depth standard. No compaction, compaction studies were done when the surface was paved. The aggregate used and still in existence is what is commonly referred to as base coat. Finish coat was never applied. A geometric type study should be completed to ensure that this surface section does meet the current municipal standard. In the event that this section of Franklin Avenue is found not to be the municipal standard, who is responsible for bringing it up to that standard? Zoning changes and development concerns. At the last public information meeting, the applicants represented provided a presentation that outlined and listed the costs associated with the development of the parcel of land. He noted that the site plan and request for zoning changes were based solely on those costs. We can only assume that the applicant fully researched and understood those costs prior to his purchase of the parcel land and understood the, the implications of the existing R1 zoning. We ask, is it fair to sub subject the residents of a quiet, well-kept neighborhood untouched for over 50 years and adjacent neighborhoods of the same standard to the stresses of an uncertain future based future because of a poor business decision. Zoning changes and development concerns continued, referencing phase one of the current revised plan, as noted, for R1 first density residential, proposed one and a half story single family dwelling. For the most part, there are no concerns as stated in, the, in this latest site plan revision and in the recommendation as it remains R1. Provisions must be in place to stipulate that the road allowance is fully completed to the current municipal standard prior to permit permits being issued for the home to be built with site plan and architectural controls in place. There may be, however, some concerns with the proposed setback of the single family dwelling as showing in this revised site plan. Concerns have now been raised whether or not the existing Franklin Avenue Road with the surface fronting 179 is the municipal standard and as to who is responsible it would be to bring the section up to the municipal standard if found not to be. Verification of the existing surface should be considered. And what we're showing on here is this is approximately the front of 179. Franklin Avenue and where the single family dwelling is uh, the setback. 
it's considerably front forward facing. And then this box here, we're showing uh, approximately where on uh, where it intersects Woodside Drive to the barricade. This section here is what we're questioning whether it is to the current municipal standard, the actual road surface itself. Zoning changes and pardon me, zoning changes and development concerns continued, specific to R3, third density residential semi detached dwelling. The recommendation to allow the building of one semi detached two story dwelling. Referencing our previous discussions dated July 22nd and November 12th, we remain in opposition to the request and the application for zoning changes from R1 to R3 designation. In addition, we feel that if the zoning change is granted, this application may view this as a precedent-setting opportunity specific to future development of the remaining lots of this parcel of land. Disposal of construction waste materials. The applicant has demonstrated a lack of concern for the neighborhood, for the environment, and for authority. When forced to remove construction waste materials from another of the applicant's developments, rather than take those materials to the local landfill site, he simply dumped those materials on the parcel of land in question. When forced to move those dumped materials from this property, with the applicant made an attempt to bury, bury the material on site. As a result, he was made to unearth the material under the supervision of the Ministry of Environment. However, we still endure the effects of that removal process, as the two primary removal locations to date have not been backfilled. The two pits are approximately two to three deep, two to three feet deep, and for the most part of the time filled with varying amounts of seepage and rainwater. We believe there is a bylaw that deals with standing water. This is and should be considered a safety concern as small children are attracted to such things, particularly now that ice is, informing, ice is forming on top of the standing water. In the event that construction should start at some time in the future, what guarantees are going to be put in place to ensure that waste materials and leftover construction materials are properly, properly disposed of in a timely fashion and land, at a tool landfill site? Now what we're showing here is the most open pit it's probably uh, 15 meters by maybe 11 or 12 meters, and it is right down to the bedrock surface. These are still remnants of material from what was originally dumped there, and in the background, there's an old uh, jacuzzi-type bathtub. The next slide just uh, shows a different view of it. Our final comments, and I will not go to side, slide 12. Our neighborhood has a proven track record in that over the years, everyone has complied with the rules and regulations in respect to the R1 designation. Mr. Pinelli purchased the property knowing that it was R1 residential. We do not feel it is unreasonable for him to comply with our concerns and demands as he knowingly purchased the property zoned R1 residential. We trust you will make an informed decision. Thank you. Questions, comments, otherwise? Thanks, Gary. Is there anyone that else would want to speak on this motion? Or questions? Gary? Any, any questions I'm, for Gary, anybody? Or? Go ahead, uh, Council Butters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. This question is actually through to Mr. Aquilino or Mr. Hansen. Um, could you just um, address the, the question about the Franklin Avenue Road and it, its um, municipal standard or not municipal standard and who's responsible for what Gary's talking about? Thank you. Mr. Hansen. <coughs> Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, that section of roadway that's paved now is a municipal responsibility. It was constructed uh, by the owner of the house that was built uh, that we see at the end of Franklin Avenue and it was built to the current standard of the existing Franklin Road just for that extension onto that property. I, ca I can't speak to the condition of the asphalt that's there now. It was done in the mid-90s, I believe, but it is a municipal responsibility to maintain that piece of roadway. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. If Councilor Butters. And just to follow up on the, the um, open uh, pits that 
Mr. Gavrilok has identified in the photos um, to whichever one of staff wants to tackle it. Is there, um, is there bylaw possibilities here that this uh, can be taken care of? Because I see that as a huge safety concern. Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Butters, under our property standards bylaw, we can look into this matter, absolutely. Council also has the removal of topsoil, which I'm assuming that was done, and you need to have a permit in place by the city. So we would look into that, and uh, we'll have bylaw enforcement look into the matter. Gary? Can I make one comment, uh, Mr. Hansen? Uh, just to correct the, uh, the road uh, surface that's in place there to the barricade was um, put in place by the former uh, owner of the lot not the current uh, owner of the property and uh, builder of the house. Thank you. Thank you. We just, I'm just trying to help you. Yeah, yeah. I just need a little direction here, folks. So yeah. you and Kojiko land, just hang on one second. What you right now, um, be spoken. If anybody, if there's nobody else registered, if, if I can. This time we'd have to, we would ask if there was any else that wanted to speak on the motion. No one else. Thank you. Okay. So now we have to deal with uh, the amendment. The amendment. You, you have a mover. We need a, we need a mover and seconder. You have it. Okay. We have that. Okay. So you're voting on the amendment. So we'll have it. Okay. All right. So now we have to. Vote on the amendment. So you're going to ask if members of council will support the amendment or support the motion for the amendment. Okay. <laughs> All right. One second. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just want uh, clarity on the amend the amendment. Um, I have here that um, the uh, approval will be subject to the extension of Franklin Avenue, correct, through to West Side Road. Is that also subject to the construction and installation of water, wastewater, storm sewer services? Yes. Okay, up to municipal standard, and uh, and then subject to the submission of a traffic impact study for review and comment to the MTO, and proper securities are in place for the construction of said road. Correct. correct? Thank you. Okay, so now we'll have to accept the amendment. You're going to be. Can I ask? Yep. Yeah. If, if I may, Deputy Mayor, is 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 that catch everything that we need to be have on the, as conditions? Are there other studies that require here? Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Mr. Heil, we would require it to be constructed for full municipal services. Uh, and the intersection upgrade if it warrants that from the Ministry of Transportation, which we will then engage them once we have Council's discretion of the amendment and the traffic study for their review. Uh, Deputy Mayor, that's the intention of the motion. We'll incorporate that wording to make sure that it's all encompassing. this time we'll take a vote to accept the amendment okay all in favor all opposed I guess it's carried right okay it's carried that's, the amendment. that's the on the amendment on the main motion so, so now we'll have a vote on the main motion as amended okay thank you so all in favor of the main motion as amended, as amended. All opposed? Motion's carried. Motion's carried. Okay. So we'll move along. The matter's finished. 
Okay. Okay, so we'll move along to uh, item 20, uh, Councillor Demers. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Region of Niagara, <laughs> read 2011 <coughs> National Household Survey, Niagara Overview, ICP Report 111 2013. That the correspondence received from the Region of Niagara, read 2011 National Household Survey, Niagara Overview, ICP Report 111 2013, be received for information. Thank you, Councillor Demers. Would you like to speak on that? No, just a seconder. Okay, last for a mover and seconder. Councillor Butters. Uh, no, I didn't want to speak on it. I just oh. wanted to vote. Okay. Okay. So we'll have the uh, the vote on the uh, item there. All in favor? All opposed? I'm in favor. <laughs> I'm thinking there's a mutiny out there. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving right along. <laughs> so notice of motions, Ashley. Okay. So now we'll uh, go to the notice of motions. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Butters, Councillor Doucette. And this ends uh, the first part of round one here. <laughs> so now we'll go to our regular uh, council uh, regular, agenda. regular agenda here. Thanks for coloring the pages so I know where I'm going. <laughs> so we'll have an introduction of the addendum items. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. There are um, a few items I'd like to highlight this evening. Um, the first was uh, circulated via addendum on Friday afternoon. We have uh, a couple of closed session items for Council's consideration this evening. Minutes of the November 25th closed session portion of the Council meeting and then a confidential memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding the potential disposition or acquisition of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act. Uh, subsection 239-2C, a proposed or pending acquisition of city-owned land. And then finally, um, uh, with regard to the amendment on item 14 from the Committee of the Whole, the associated bylaw will be pulled for Council consideration this evening uh, to be presented at the next Council meeting. Thank you. So, come on, confirmation of the agenda. Okay. Yeah, whatever the okay. is. So, we'll have to uh, confirm the agenda. Council Doucette. Councillor Kenny, take the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Any uh, disclosures of interest this evening? None. Thank you very much. And adoption of the minutes of the uh, 44th regular meeting of Council, November 25th, 2013. Councillor Butters, Councillor Kenny. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, adoption of the uh, council items not requiring a separate discussion. Oh, sorry, my, my apologies. Uh, determination of council items requiring separate discussion. Nothing this evening? Adoption of the council items not requiring a separate discussion. Mover and seconder, Council Butters, Council Demers. Right. Hmm? All in favor? It's carried. Okay, so we don't do so it's proclamations. Okay, so well, proclamations there are none this evening. And uh, minutes of boards and commissions and committees, there's none, none there as well. So we'll have notice of motion. All in favor? No notice of motions. <laughs> okay. So then we'll have the introduction, the consideration of bylaws or passages and bylaws. Thank you. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. That the following bylaws be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw 60271313 being a bylaw to authorize entering into an easement agreement with Heritage Family Holdings for the purpose of a private utility connection between 4601 and 4884 Forks Road. Bylaw 60281343 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 89 being a bylaw regulating traffic and parking on city roads. That's White Road. Bylaw 60291353 being a bylaw to establish a schedule of rates and fees for engineering and operation services for 2014. Bylaw 60301363, a bylaw to authorize the temporary borrowing of $4 million for 2014. Bylaw 60311313 being a bylaw to confirm appointments to boards and committees. And finally, bylaw 60321313, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a letter of understanding for an extension to an agreement with the Welland and District SPCA. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Steele, Councillor Bodner. All in favor? Opposed? There we go. Confirmatory bylaw. Thank you that the following bylaw be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw 60331393, being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Colborne at its regular meeting, December 9, 2013. Thank you, Ashley. Mover and seconder. Councillor Butters, Councillor Kenny. Anything else? All those in favor? <laughs> All righty. My favorite, oh, wait a minute. Sorry. What are you going to do? Okay. Um, so at this time, I'll call for a motion to go uh, into camera, into closed camera. Councilor Doucette. Councilor Steele. That council do now proceed in camera in order to address the following matters. Minutes of the closed session portion of November 25th, 2013 council meeting and a confident confidential memorandum from the director of planning and development dated December 5th, 2013 regarding the potential disposition of city owned land pursuant to the municipal act 2001 subsection 239 2C, a proposed or pending acquisition of land by the municipality or local boards. All in favor? Councilor Doucette. Okay, we're all good to go. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Heil. Just a quick reminder, Your Worship, or Mr. Deputy Mayor, of the budget meeting on Monday coming at 5.30. The Ontario Municipal Board will reconvene on Monday morning here um, in respect of uh, Birdie Golf from Monday and Tuesday. Special Council will be meeting in, in, in the whole to consider the first review of the city's draft budget staff presentation has been circulated. It is available in its entirety on the internet for any pub member of the public to have a look at. So that's available. Um, so we'll now proceed into a uh, closed section. I've just been handling a very important document here and uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for uh, being here tonight and putting up with my stumbling uh, through this meeting. Uh, definitely a learning experience and uh, I guess I kind of enjoyed it and uh, appreciate all the help I've been given on my left and right this evening. Uh, I'd like to wish the city and uh, everyone else uh, a very Merry Christmas. Uh, it's a special time of year and uh, please take time for uh, family and friends and uh, enjoy the season and uh, we'll hope to see you all back in the first of the new year. Thank you so much and uh, good night. Get out of here.